ipmnation.com. City when you're in it, watch the people walk by. And if you listen real close, you can hear them talk about their lives. And some hate it, some love it, some are tough, and some are just tired. These are the people in the neighborhood, they just trying to make it out right. See, she never wanted to be a New Yorker, but she definitely. Hey, good evening, everybody. This is Dr. John Rich, and you've tuned in to Dr. John's Neighborhood. I'm um, Delighted to be here with you once again. I wanted to make a quick announcement right here at the front of the show that uh, the show is going to try to take a new turn starting next week where I'm going to be inviting uh, comedians to be on the show with me, kind of like a sidekick kind of thing. Um, I feel like I'm funnier than I end up usually sounding on the show. Um this is going to sound arrogant, and I don't mean it to be, but I'm probably the funniest person that you would ever meet. I'm just kidding. That's <laughs> um, uh, But I figured that, you know, we can deal with serious topics and also have jokes in the middle. It probably make the show more interesting. It probably be a little more lively. And so uh, we're going to start next week with a friend of my brother's His name is Mike. He's a stand up comedian in New York and see how that goes. I encourage you to check out my books on Amazon. You can just uh, search for Positive Parenting. Also, my website, drjohnrich.com. I just started a YouTube channel. You can just search for Dr. John Rich, and you'll see me there uh, looking pensive. And uh, we also have this podcast, which airs every Friday night uh, on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and also ipmnation.com. So thanks for tuning in. I have on the air somebody that I haven't spoken to like directly uh, for, I think we said 35 years, something ridiculous like that. Uh, her name is Renee Beck. Can you say hello, Renee? Hey, how are you? So Renee is somebody that I met way back in high school in a church youth group and, uh, She's a, an admirable personality, even online. She's a formidable person, and you don't want to fuck with her. And she <laughs> says what she thinks. And uh, so I'm happy to have uh, you on. Um, what What are your memories of that time? Oh, gosh. Well, first of all, you were hilarious. See, I told you. <laughs> Um, and really, really crazy smart. Mm. And, um, just always, we just always had a very good friendship of just being able to be honest with each other. Yeah. Which I, I think when you're like 14 and 15 and you're trying to be something you're not, that when you have that friendship of you can really be who you are, that is something that is cherished. Well, you know, what's interesting about that group and I don't know how much people knew it at the time, but, you know, I had been pretty heavily involved in drugs and all, all sorts of juvenile delinquent behavior that threatened to put me in prison when I came upon that group. And uh, I, I feel like a lot of the people who were in that group had grown up in that church. And so it was easier for me, I think, to stand out because I didn't know what the rules were or what was expected or how you were supposed to behave. It seemed like you knew what the rules were, but you still didn't know how to behave. <laughs> no. No. And it's funny because I had really only found that group maybe a, a year before you did. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did that happen? Um, it was the same thing. It was just kind of like, you know, it was junior high and kind of running wild and running with a bad crowd and, um, you know, found it happened, of course, and there was like a cute boy that was involved. Oh. And, um, yeah. Are you willing to and tell us who the cute boy was? It was Dan at the time. Dan Spong. Okay. It was. I would love to Dan. find out what happened with him. Um, I talked to him a couple years ago. Did you? Okay. So yeah. Right. yeah. Good. Good. Um, 
yeah. So and that's just how I got involved in that. I think it was, you know, it's like me and Susan and Charlene. And uh, I think it was just a lot of us just needed that yeah. grounding. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a good group. And Barry was uh, pretty good at what he was doing, from what I recall. He was, yeah, he was really great. So these are all like, basically people are listening to us talk about people and they have no idea who any of them are. And I don't know how interesting it is, but uh, Renee and I have been friends uh, from a long time back. And then even when our paths split, there's been like an online connection uh, on Facebook and things like that. So when I found out that uh, your husband died, it really affected me. Uh, not, not just in a selfish way because I'm married and the idea of losing my wife is terrifying to me, but also just because I don't want my friends to go through things like that. So can you tell us a little bit about your husband and the timeline of when you got married and, you know, just like give us a broad brushstroke met my husband back in, um, I was in high school. He oh. was older. He was my friend's brother, Amy Arnold's brother. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So then, you know, flash forward high school, college after college. And that's kind of when we started dating. Um, and you know, we got married and we were married for several years and then we had our son. And then when our son was in kindergarten, my, my husband was diagnosed with, um, a cancerous tumor on his tongue. On his um, tongue. On his tongue. Huh. Yes. I've never he heard had, of that. He had, he had 15. It's the same one that um, Eddie Van Halen has had um, and Michael Douglas. Huh. Um, okay. It's part of head and neck cancer. And he had a surgery and he had, um, it was like a 15 hour surgery. And then he had radiation and then he was kind of in remission. And they don't really like to use that word anymore. Right. But he was cancer free for several years and then it came back and then he basically did three years of nonstop chemo until he was just tired. Huh. And then, so he made a decision to stop? No, they, he would have kept fighting as in doing the chemo as long as he could have. But the doctors finally just said to him, there's, it's spreading and there's nothing that we can do to keep it at bay anymore. Wow. And so did they give him a time frame at that point? They didn't. They, they did not. They said it, they don't know. Okay. Um, so they said it could be weeks or it could be months. And it wound up being about a month and a half. Huh. So um, how did that affect things? I know before the show you talked about, uh, I know that maybe you don't mean this the way it might sound to an outsider, but that him having cancer wasn't all bad meaning that it kind of like shook things loose, right? Right. When he was first diagnosed, he chose to deal with his cancer and be positive Mm -hmm. about it. Like, yes, it was awful, but he was such a trooper. Um, You know, he really, really was. I mean, he, the social workers at Fox Chase Cancer Center would reach out to him sometimes to come to the hospital to speak to someone who was struggling with his same kind of cancer. Uh-huh. Um, Cause it was a lot. He wasn't able to talk as clearly. Right. He wasn't able to eat as clearly. He was basically on a liquid diet for six years. Goodness. There was a lot. Yeah. There was a lot. But on the other hand, you know, he was able to stay home with Jack. He was able to be the, he still did baseball and basketball coaching. Um, and that maybe that he wouldn't have. Yeah. Had he not been sick, like had that not happened, he might've said, Oh, I'll do it next year. Well, there might not be a next year. So he did it. Yeah. Well, that's Um, a lesson for everybody, right? There might not be a next year for any of us. So I think, I think in that aspect, like, you know, he really became that quote unquote, like live like you were dying song. I think that's, if there was something to do, he, he did it. Yeah. Well, so when, when you think about him before he got the diagnosis, you know, was he just, I mean, like, was he an asshole and then he became a nice person or was it more like 
He was kind of sucked into just no, he was average, daily he was life. An average person. Uh-huh. He had good and he had bad. Yeah. And um, but I think once he got sick, I, I think his innate goodness came through a lot more. Hmm. How about yeah. you? Did it have the same effect on you? Uh, no. 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 Because you weren't the one that was dying, so you weren't. I was the one. I was the one that suddenly was thrust onto holding holding it together financially. Yeah. Because remember, this kind of all happened too. We were just coming out of the Great Recession. We were just starting to get back on our feet after getting knocked down. Um, so I had a lot of of that pressure on my shoulders. Right. Um, you know, and I had to make a lot of decisions in the last three years because once that cancer came back I knew we had less time than more right and you know I didn't want to grieve him while he was still here and I think that that's very key like I did not spend my nights crying about something that hadn't happened yet Uh uh-huh but on the other hand I was also preparing financially and doing some, uh, putting some other things in place. Okay. That I knew that we would need to do, like like having what? my parents, like my parents moved in to help take care of Jack, so I could I could work. Right. Okay. Um. You know, even switching school districts, I, I switched jobs from a less stressful job, so I did take a little bit of a pay cut, but it was worth it because uh-huh. there's there's no way on on the other their job I had and it was very high pressure there's no way I would have had a heart attack on the floor yeah like had to make changes so did you see yourself as okay so here's my husband and he's now handling his upcoming demise to put it uh indelicately by grabbing life by the balls and really trying to you know enjoy the time that he had left and then on your side you're having to do all the nitty-gritty of keeping everything afloat did you look at that in any way resentfully or was that kind of like you're giving yeah. that gifts so that he could do that right so i took a lot of that burden on okay i'm just like like you know like as far as even with jack like good cop bad cop like my husband was good cop and i was bad cop and mm-hmm. i was okay with that like you know how usually it's like we'll wait till your father gets home yeah um well it was kind of reversed right and that was okay because he needed that time he needed to make those years with jack count uh-huh so and so know. so jack was of conscious age at this time, right? Like he was, yeah. he was kindergarten through, how old was he when Herb died? Um, he was 11. Okay. So he was just starting sixth grade. Yeah. And so Two does he have, outside of starting school. did it pay off for you? Like when you talk with him about his memories of his father, does he have memories of, Her, we used to ones. have fun. We used to do all this and. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Great. Yep. They used to go fishing every day in the summertime. They, you know, wrote um, Herb's Harley that he had splurged on. And yeah, absolutely. It, it, it worked out. It, yeah. I wouldn't have done it any other way. Hmm. Hmm. So uh, let's talk about you and your experience after the loss. Like I know from reading about death and dying and things like that, that there's a different process for people who, like my father, he died in 91, 92, I think it was 92. In January, I saw him, I said goodbye, I went to school, and when I got to school, the phone rang and he had died on my way to school, so I turned back around. I mean, he had bronchitis from smoking cigarettes, so I knew that he wasn't going to live to be an old age, but there was no warning there. And so the grief that my mother had to go through where there he is, and then he goes to bed and you never see him again, uh, is different than, much worse than somebody who has like the time to 
adjust to what's happening? You think it's worse? Oh, I can't even imagine because I was able to have Jack in support groups Uh for um, cancer, for kids that have cancer in their family, whether they have cancer, sibling or a parent. So we, we did that for almost two years Uh before her passed. So, you know, we had, you know, he was able, I was not in those groups with him. It was just his peers and, you know, certified counselors. Um, and that was wonderful for him. So he was able to find ways to discuss his feelings. Yeah. Um, they did age appropriate activities. They did, and they would tell us, so this is what we're covering tonight and whatever religious connotations you want to put on the conversation on the way home. I see. So So it, it worked out great for us that way because Jack and I were always kind of on the same page. Right. Are you religious? Would you say? No. No. Mm-mm. I was just Not curious anymore. since that I know we met in church or whatever and I was just curious whether that was a, a necessary that, that conversation. Same. Yeah, kind of that same American, uh, not not really a churchgoer, but I have my beliefs, uh-huh. and they're definitely in that Christian vein. I just don't go to church every week. Right. Just curious. Uh, yeah. No judgment, but if they're saying, like, if you want to have a conversation on the way home, and I wondered whether there were conversations that needed to be had. And we did, and we had them. Uh-huh. And we did, we had them, but you know, because someone in our group might've been Jewish or there was one that was um, Hindu. Right. So, you know, they, they were not having a religious discussion in those groups. Yeah. Right. Well, I would imagine it was sponsored by the hospital, I guess, or. No, it was actually um, just like the cancer support network. Of, okay. um, the one that we were in was Gilda's club after Gilda Radner. Uh huh that was geared towards children, but that's kind of been absorbed into like this overall cancer support network group, but it's not run through a hospital. So if someone wanted to find out about that, what would they Google? Um, if you would Google Gilda's club, they're going to, uh, come up with something. That'll send you in the Um, right direction. Yeah. Yeah. So let me read you a quote, getting back to like how you dealt with things. Um, This is an article that I am familiar with about grief and things like that. And this is a quote from a a woman who, this is nine years after her husband died. Um, She said, in the beginning, I felt that my heart physically ached. I felt it was on fire. The yearnings were too hard to bear. I couldn't breathe. I was sad most of the day. As time passed, the grief became a part of life, something I learned to live with, and alongside the grief emerged feelings of joy and happiness, hope and optimism. Today, the grief is a part of who I am. I embrace it as a part of me, but it takes a smaller part of my life as I go along. And I was wondering how you resonated with that quote, if you did. I do. Uh, And for me, you know, my husband was so strong for so long and the last year was really rough. Uh So with with cancer, at at some point when he passed, we were just so grateful that it was over for him and that he was not suffering anymore. Right. So we had a lot of time of just that overall relief, relief that it was over. Yeah. Um, My saddest part is that I will always grieve for my son losing his father. Uh-huh. Like I lost my partner, but I'm a big girl and I can put on my big girl panties and, and continue on through life. You losing your parent is something that can never, ever, ever be replaced. So that makes me much sadder. I um, mean, I have three older stepchildren that are all in their twenties. And so like that makes me sadder that, that he'll never walk his daughters down the aisle. Right. But, that being said, I also don't want to be that person that was like when one of my stepdaughters gets married and he's not walking them down the aisle. I don't want that day to be marred with yeah. the, oh, 
I it's it's beautiful, but it was bittersweet because he's not here. Right. And I don't I don't want to live that way. Yeah. My mother actually said that on my wedding tape. If I can put put that out there, just and you know I understand, and yet at the same time it did detract a little bit. You know that. Uh, so that's uh, nice of you to be mindful about that. Right. Yeah. Um, no, I will never. I just, you know, my mother-in-law was that way. Uh-huh. So she spent 15 years grieving. And um, no matter what we did for her, no matter how much fun we had, everything was bittersweet. And it drove me crazy mm-hmm. for 15 years. Right. Crazy. I, I, insane. So how how would you say your life, this is going to seem weird, but I mean, how would you say your life since is different than it would have been had he not died? Other than the fact that he's not there, obviously. But I mean, do, are you living a different life than the one that you envisioned? I mean, overall, with him being sick and him being sick for so long, it financially drained us. Yeah. Um, you just can't fight cancer for seven years and just not go broke. Right. It's very, very, very rare that you find someone that's not broke by the end of it. Uh huh. Um, so I'm not as financially settled as I would like to be at 49. Right. Um, but what are you going to do? You know, we made, decisions to you know go on vacation maybe that we wouldn't have yeah but you know you got to do what you got to do and um it i i think we made the right decisions for us yeah um uh, the question comes from this idea that a lot of people who they get married and then they have this vision like i have a vision of what's going to happen in my family you know my kids are going to finish school and then they're going to go off to college and my wife and I are going to continue to be married and we're going to have a different life after the kids are gone and we'll, you know, we're going to retire, we're going to get old together and all this kind of thing. And of course, you know, I don't know that that's going to happen, but if one of us were to pass then that entire vision of what the rest of life is going to look like is now gone. And yeah, I said goodbye to that dream six years ago. Uh huh. So I let that go because how? that's not that's not how it was. I mean, that's not how it was going to work out for us. So we, you know, it's just it's just not. So I try to not focus on what I don't have anymore. Yeah. Um, and I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, on the other hand, I mean, you, you've known me for a long time and I was okay. I was always okay on my own. Yeah. So I've never been like that needy chick that needed a boyfriend. Right. Uh, that was never me. So like I said, I made decisions to try to make, to get my life to be, where I wanted it to be. Where where does that come from? How how do you end up that person? Is that your mother? Did your was your mother fiercely independent like that as well? Um, my mom is not like you know, she wasn't like a fiercely independent bra burner by any means, going back to women's lip, but my mom always made sure she saw so many of her friends that would get divorced in their thirties and that they were left broke. Uh and homeless, and living on our couch for weeks. Um, So she was always, you know, you have to have an escape plan. You always have to have this plan. You always have to, you know, so I think that's where it came from. Yeah. You know, you just don't let that relationship define you. So how long ago was it that he died? How many years now? Oh, just in August. Not even a year. Not even a year. So we're at like eight months. Okay. All right. I thought that it was a little longer than that. Yeah, no. Um, so how about you have just Jack? You have the stepchildren, but the you only have one child with her? I only have one child with her, correct. Okay. And so how has that, how has having him, he's still in the house, right? 
correct. He's only 11. 11 years oh, old. 12. 12 as of Friday. Okay. Oh, all right. Friday. Um, happy birthday, Jack. <laughs> I always like that name. That's my, like, if I want to use a different name for some reason, that's the name that I uh, end up using. I always like that name. <laughs> Um, it's a good one. Yeah. So how how has having him around helped or complicated the process of like getting back on your feet, etc.? Well, I mean, definitely he's the whole reason that I get up in the morning. Mm. Um, you know, and I know he's the only, he, he was so young. The reason that my husband battled so long and so hard was because, you know, he had a five-year-old son. Yeah. Um, you know, when his older son, I mean, you know, his older children, yeah, they were all like basically out of high school by that point. Right. So, you know, I don't think he would have gone through the struggle as much. Um, so there's that. So there's that whole aspect of it. Um, you know, and again, I, Jack and I have, we're very tight. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we do have a very strong relationship as I have a strong relationship with my parents as well. But, um, you know, I think that we, realize that we're like team Arnold kind of us <laughs> against the world. And I think we've all felt that way. The three of us since the beginning yeah. of this journey. Um, so. so let's talk about people out there who are listening, whose spouses are still alive. Um, mm -hmm. I know that your story in particular is about, you know, trying to adapt to the death of somebody who went through a long illness first. But any words of advice for people who, you know, they have no idea when it's going to happen. There isn't a warning bell. They're not currently sick. They're just living their married life. Um, what kinds of thoughts might you have as somebody who's on the other side of something that most of us would rather not think about? Yeah, don't let anything go unsaid. Mm. You know, I, I know when my husband was, in, you know, in his last week, and we didn't know when he was going to pass, and his actual passing was quite sudden. Like, he was fine one day and passed the next. Mm. But we were sitting there, and we're just watching TV, and I turned to him and I said, I, I feel like we should be having, like, these deep, heart-wrenching conversations, not just sitting here watching TV. And he said, well, we have nothing left unsaid. Uh -huh. And he's like, and I just want to be normal. Right. I'm, okay. Yeah. So I think that's the thing. Like, you know, um, my husband was in AA. Okay. And so, you know, he had always been in that process of making amends and, and, and doing those things. So he, when he passed, he didn't, didn't really have anything unsaid or undone right because the aa program requires you to address decisions you've made and correct and confront people whom you may have uh, wronged right and, and and just overall face your feelings so you know that process had had begun you know even before he was sick so like i said we didn't he didn't I think that's the big thing is not, you know, when you say, oh, my God, I never got to say this to that person. And I think that's the saddest thing indeed. Right. Yeah, I think that's part of losing somebody so quickly is that you're like, oh, man, if I just had them here for five more minutes, so I would tell them, you know, X or Y. Right. And then you can't do that. Do you, um, I mean, it's stupid to say, do you think about him, but like, do you have feelings of like him being there with you, like feeling his presence or, or, you know what I mean? Like that he's yeah, kind of like I, there. I, sometimes I definitely like hear his voice for uh -huh. sure. Uh -huh. 
Um, and, you know, other times it, it seems that he's like very far away and that was a really long time ago. Yeah. So, I mean, it just, you know, it's just one of those like really weird things. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's probably pretty normal to uh, feel that kind of way, and I was curious whether that was part of your experience. Um, so what's next for you? What's your, you know, when you think out on the horizon? Uh, um, yeah, I'm not really sure. I, um, you know, I, I'm in a support group, and some members of that group are, are dating and they had a loss the same time as mine. Right. And I'm not ready to do that. Yeah. Um, I'm not taking it off the table for forever, but for, for right now I'll, I'll pass. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just one day at a time. Just, yeah. Just trying to get it done. Yeah. Well, it sounds like on the good side, you've got a pretty wide network of support. You say you're close to your parents. I'm sure you have. Yeah, and that has been huge. That has just been huge, I think, is even just my friends that have checked in all the time. Um, God, it's just so different. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it might be another lesson for people out there is uh, to try not to be so isolated. You know, you're married and you tend to kind of enclose yourself with your family, just taking care of everyday business. But then if you're really isolated, then uh, if you're in a situation where support would help, you don't have as many phone numbers to dial in. Right. And, you know, I've always had you know, most of my close friends. And then even though the, the, the friends from that support group that became very close friends very quickly when you're all going through something together. Yeah. Um, and, and we were there for each other and we have, you know, group texts of when something weird happens, do you know what I mean? Just mm -hmm. like, Oh, either good, good or bad. Yeah. Weird. So, okay. Where did you find that support group? Was that through so, the Gilda Club as well? It was, yeah, it was so someone else that I knew whose wife had had leukemia um, and they had their children through it. Yeah. And she had passed and their kids are, you know, not hot messes. <laughs> you know, they're, they're very well rounded. They deal, they dealt with the loss and they have moved on, not, not moved on, but moved through it. Um, so that it didn't dominate their lives and ruin their lives as opposed to I've seen it on the other end yeah, where it did kind of ruin their life and they're emotionally stunted from the time that their mom had passed. So I, I didn't want to go that route either. Mm -hmm. So I knew that we had to do something that was going to give Jack the skills yeah. that he needed. Well, that's very wise of you. I find in the field of psychology that there are quite a number of people who are too proud to go and try to find help or try to find counseling or or get some kind of support from someone who's trained in the crisis that you're enmeshed in. And uh, it's really silly. Yeah, because, because most of us don't have that skill set to teach that to our children. Uh -huh. I mean, that's just not even possible. Yeah. Well, I think the majority of people try very hard not to think about dying. It's hard to live a life if you're thinking about that kind of thing uh, too frequently. And so to reach out to somebody whose job it is to have that on their mind and to help other people process those kinds of things, it makes as much sense as taking your car to the mechanic when your brakes go bad, unless you know how to fix brakes, but I know it's not exactly the same, but I'm well, trying to encourage people, on. encourage people to get counseling when you need it and don't be ridiculous. 
It doesn't mean you're crazy. And if you're crazy, then you should go anyway. So <laughs> whether you're crazy or not, um, you can always benefit. Yeah, no, no, I agree 100%. It was just, um, yeah, it definitely, uh, it made such a difference and for you're, us. You're still going, right? You still go to this the support yeah, group? Yeah, it's, well, we're not, we're not in the support group, um, like the family support. We're now moved over into the bereavement support. Okay, so what's the difference? So the, the family support group was for kids that, whose parents actively have cancer. Uh-huh. Um, and so a lot of those families, they are involved in it and then they, you know, go have breast cancer and then, you know, that they go into remission okay. cancer free and they're gone and they never have to come back and deal with it again. And it has helped them through that family crisis. Yeah. That's not how ours worked out. Right. So we continued um, and then started up in a bereavement group uh-huh. uh, called living. It's like a living with loss. Living with loss. Okay. Yep. Great. Well, listen, I, thanks again for giving me your time and making yourself vulnerable here to these random anonymous people who are living, uh, <laughs> or who are listening. Um, that's, uh, you're very courageous. I'm sure plenty of people don't want to talk about it and, uh, would rather not be on a radio show talking about all the things that have happened. Yeah, it's not, it's not fun. I, I wouldn't wish it on my, you know, worst enemy here, yeah. but, um, you know, it's not all doom and gloom either. You can move through it. And I think that's the really important thing is you, you don't get over it. You just get through it. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Well, I think the fear is that it, it will turn you into a basket case and you won't be able to survive it and it's certainly painful i didn't haven't lost a spouse but i lost a parent and um that was a long time ago and it still hurts me a little bit at times but you know life comes at you and then you adapt to what happened um so you just find the same kinds of strength that you found in other situations that were hard. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like I said, it's not anything that is fun, but it's doable. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, thanks Renee. And thank you listener for right. tuning in. I want to encourage you once again, check out my book, check out my website but more importantly, reach out if you need somebody to talk to or you want some information about the article that I referenced earlier or you want to get some opinions about how to find a counselor that might be able to help with things that you're going through. You can email me at info, I-N-F-O, at drjohnrich.com. I'll talk to you next week. Bye. Ah, living in a city when you're in it, watch the people walk by. And if you listen real close, you can hear them talk about their lives And some hate it, some love it, some are tough and some are just tired These are the people in the neighborhood, they just trying to make it out right See, she never wanted to be a New Yorker But she definitely be the New Yorker All these intellectual porn stars IPMNation.com 